Today, we're going to be looking at one of the most important questions in this entire series. And we're going to see, until this question is answered, no true change can happen. No transformation can begin. We are in the middle of a series that we're calling Becoming Whole, and we're looking at biblical transformation. And what we're going to do today is look at a story of where Jesus heals a man and see what we might learn from this man's interactions with Jesus. And what we're going to see is this. Without true risk, there can't be any true change. Or to put it another way, without risk, there can be no restoration. Without risk, there can be no restoration. We're going to be looking at John 5, uh, verses 1 to 9 today. Uh, My name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. It is so good to be with you today. Wherever you find yourself, we're so glad that you are joining us online. We hope that you are blessed and encouraged uh, and even challenged by today's sermon. So let me go ahead and pray for our time together, and we'll get going. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you pursue us in the person of Jesus. And I pray today for uh, hearts that would be opened and receptive um, to the questions you would ask us, and that you would help us to step into and continue to walk in this process of biblical transformation of true change of becoming whole. And so we give you today, and we ask for you to work through the power of your word and in the power of your spirit. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus, and by your spirit. Amen. Well, let's look at uh, John chapter 5 today, verses 1 to 9. I'll be reading from the uh, CSB version today. And uh, the Gospel of John, just a, a, little, a little context here for the Gospel of John, is written by the Apostle John. Uh, And he says in chapter 20 that he writes this book so that you may uh, see, that you may believe that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you would have true life. And so there are many stories in the Gospel of John. In fact, he says there's many more things I could have said. And this is just one story of Jesus demonstrating who he is and his intention for those who would call upon his name. So let's look at verse 1, chapter 5. Here's what we read. After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the way, in the Bible, you always go up to Jerusalem, no matter which direction you're coming from, because it is God's city. It's where God's presence has resided. So Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and by the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man, one man in particular there, who had, laid, who had been disabled for 38 years, When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus says to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat and started to walk. Pretty amazing story. What, what do we see in these verses? Just a couple observations when we look at the first couple of verses here. Okay, this is a Jewish festival. We're not sure which one. And Jesus, or John rather, is, is very specific. He says, hey, uh, by the sheep gate uh, in Jerusalem, there's a pool called Bethesda where there's five colonnades. Now, in that day, these people likely would have been able to go and verify that this was, in fact, a real place. Uh, in, in fact, archaeology confirms that this is a real place. There's a church called the Church of St. Anne, which is believed to be built uh, uh, roughly over the site of where this uh, particular place was. And so this just goes to show that Jesus is talking about a, a real place. He's, he's talking about a real place, a real person with real people at a real time. And so this actually happened. And what we saw here in verses 3 to 5 says, uh, Within these uh, lay a large number of disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed people. And one man uh, was there who had been disabled for 38 years. So evidently, in this area of the temple, this is where all the uh, disabled people would congregate. They probably received alms there, uh, money and food and and other things. In fact, uh, uh, Jewish law uh, would would, uh, require those to give alms to the poor. And so this was a place where they all congregated. And so here Jesus is coming to this place in the temple, and um, and there's one man that he is going to engage with, one man who had been disabled for 38 years, one man against the multitude of people that were there. And so this man, it says he has been disabled for 38 years. Now that is a lifetime. I'm 39, so this is just 
uh, you know, one year younger than I am. And many people on that day didn't even live to be 38 years old. And so this man, I mean, we have to connect with this story and think about uh, this man, disabled, probably couldn't walk. Um, we don't know exactly what his um, disability was, but here he is, and this is all he's known his whole life. He said to ask others for help. He uh, doesn't enjoy many of the things that you and I take for granted every day, as simple as getting up and walking or driving or going wherever we want. This man did not have those experiences. He's probably had to beg for most of his life. He's probably been looked down upon, ridiculed, thought of as less than. And he congregates with others who are like him to receive mercy from others. And so this has been this man's life. It has been a hard life. It's a life that you and I can't even really imagine. But this has been his life, his experience, his story, and it's become his identity. He's a man who's been disabled for 38 years. And what's amazing is Jesus sees him. Jesus sees this man out in the multitude. Verse 6, it says, when Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time. See, Jesus sees this man. He knows this man. He knows this man's story. He knows this man's pain. This is probably some kind of divine knowledge, that this was a man that was put here for Jesus to engage with. So Jesus sees him. He comes up to him, and he has a conversation with him. I don't know if this was an unknown experience for this man. I mean, who knows how many people actually ever had a conversation with him. But here Jesus is going to engage this man, and he asks him this really odd question in verse 6. He said to him, do you want to get well? I think, well, why would he ask that question? You would think the answer would be, well, of course I do. What kind of question is that? Of course I want to be made well. But notice the man's response. He says this in verse 7, Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. You see, he doesn't even answer the question. He didn't say, yes, I'd like to be made well. Rather, he reveals what he believes to be true about his identity. He basically says this, there is no one here to help me. No one here to put me in the water. No one who actually cares about me. Even when I try to go myself, someone goes ahead of me. This is who I am. I'm a 38-year-old man who has been disabled his whole life. This is all that I am. And so we see here that he's actually put his hope in something. He's put his hope into getting into the, to the water, it says, when, it, when it's stirred up. Now, what is this talking about? It's interesting. If you, if you look in your Bible, you'll probably notice that John 5, verse 4 is missing. Uh, if you have an ESV, there's a, there's a note there that says, in some of the earliest manuscripts, there is this verse added. Uh, but in many, it's not there. And this is what the verse says. It says this, uh, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after stirring of that water was healed of whatever disease he had. And so um, now th- just let's just sidestep for a moment and look at this. Uh, maybe you think it's odd that a verse would have been removed from the Bible, but this actually, in my opinion, affirms the reliability of the Bible. And, and uh, the people willing, the scholars willing to say this actually wasn't part of the original, and so we've removed it. And so this actually, I think, underscores the reliability of the Bible that we have today, because this likely was not part of the original. But nevertheless, we see it's referred to in this stirring of the water. So it was probably added for clarification of what the belief was. And so what's going on here is there is this belief, and we don't really know where this came from. Maybe someone was healed at some point. Uh, Maybe something else is going on. There is the belief that the angel of the Lord came down, and when he stirred these waters, whoever was in first would be healed. And so this man had put his hope in getting in the water whenever this angel would happen to appear in whatever season he would. This is his hope. And he's been living in years of disappointment because he's never actually been able to get there. Disappointment. And when we step back and look at this, you know, here's a particular uh, method that has to be done in order to get healed. And in our day, we have similar things going on. You know, it's uh, if, if, uh, if I just take these five steps to freedom, then I'll be healed. Then I'll be okay. 
or if I just do this particular method, or if I just say the right prayer, or if I promise to God never to disobey him again, then he would heal me. If I would just blank, then I would be okay. Then I would be restored. Then I would be healed. This is what the man is essentially living out. It's some formula that if we do something in the right way, in the prescribed manner, then we'll be okay. But what we see here is that only Jesus can restore it. And he does it in ways that we don't really imagine. In fact, if you keep reading in this story, uh, you'll notice that it's on the Sabbath, and then the uh, religious leaders, they come along, and they say, you know, he, he's picked up his mat, and he's walking. He says, what are you doing walking on the Sabbath? They don't care that he's been healed. They, they, they don't connect with the, with the miracle that this man has just experienced. All they care about is it wasn't done in the right way. It wasn't done according to our rules. And this is often how Jesus works. He doesn't work according to our rules, according to what we expect to happen. He does so according to his own purpose in his own plan and out of his own personhood, power, and grace. And this is what we see. And so he asked the man, do you want to get well? And what the man simply does is recites what he's been saying for years. There's no one to help me. And there's no one who's going to help me be restored. You see, he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't see Jesus for who he is. He doesn't know that Jesus is the Son of God, the author of life, the one who has all power. And what Jesus says next to him must have been shocking. And it's nothing short of a miracle. In a few simple words, Jesus is going to utterly transform this man's life. It's what he says in verse 8 and 9. Jesus told him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And instantly, the man got well. He picked up his mat and he started to walk. Jesus heals him right then and there through the power of his word. Through the power of his words. And who knows what this man must have felt. I mean, I can only imagine. I don't know if there's some like magical like tingling he felt, and, and he just knew like something had happened. And for the first time in his life, he stands up and he walks. You see, his whole life has been utterly transformed. He can do things that he never could do before, simple things. He can get up and walk and go where he wants to go. He's, his whole world has changed. He's been giving a new identity, a restored man, a man made well. He's no longer the disabled man. You see, this is the level of transformation that Jesus wants to do, intends to do in you and I. Now, he may not heal us physically the way he did this man, but he absolutely intends to heal us and restore us spiritually. And so this is a model of Jesus' heart for transformation and restoration to bring us to wholeness. And so we can ask too, in what ways have we been disabled? In what ways can we no longer walk in maybe ways that we once could? In what ways have we been wounded, disabled, and the sins that we've become addicted to, and the ways that we've been sinned against, perhaps for years, perhaps for your whole life, perhaps for 38 years, just like this man, you have assumed the identity of disabled person. And this is really what we've been talking about the last couple weeks in particular. You see, when we don't heal from our wounds, we can become identified by them. And when we don't repent of our sin, we can become identified by it. But Jesus has something more. He has a new identity to give us. And so what are some of the names that you've taken, some of the identities that you've carried around with you? Maybe it's, I'm no good. I'm not worthy. I'm not loved. No one cares for me. Or I'm just an addict or I'm helpless, or I'm never going to get well. I'm just a sinner. Or maybe I'm just a wounded person. I have no hope. I'm all alone. These are some of the the names that we can accept because of our wounds, because of the sins that we have become addicted to. But these are not the names that Jesus has for you. See, Jesus wants to give you a new name 
a new identity so that you are no longer identified by your sin or by the fact that you've been sinned against. Jesus gives you a new identity, identity in Christ. And this is what transforms us, restores us, and only Jesus has the power to tell you who you truly are. That's hope. This is what Jesus longs for. It's the power of the gospel, that Jesus took all of our shame and all of our pain and all of our sin and all of our wounds on the cross, all of the false names that we have accepted for ourselves, and he gives us a new name. He makes us a new creation, literally a new kind of person. This is the miracle of the gospel, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And just a few verses earlier, here's what Paul says, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new. Behold, the new has come. This is transformation. This is what Jesus wants to do for us. He utterly transformed this man's life, and he wants to utterly transform us to become more like him. And so he stands before us and asks us the same question to this, uh, that he asked this man. Here's what he asked. Do you want to get well? This may be the most important question we answer. Do you want to get well? Or as the King James Version puts it, wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to get well? Is this your desire, your wish, your deepest desire? And maybe on the surface you say, well, of course I do. Of course, why wouldn't I want to get well? Of course I want to get well. But when we ask a few probing questions. When we look a little bit deeper, we see it's actually not that simple. You see, our hearts are still deceptive, and we cling to things that we're afraid to let go of. And so we could ask, well, why might we not want to get well? What might be lurking in us? What do we carry that prevents us from answering yes to this question? It's a good question to ask. One therapist who's practiced for years says this, the longer I have been in private practice, the more I have come to realize that the truth is that not everyone really does want to get well. Some people are more comfortable in their known discomfort than they are willing to risk the discomfort of the unknown to get well. Some are afraid of the unknown. Some people come to the pool, but they just want to be seen in their sickness. This is a a powerful observation from someone who sat with many people. And I think when we begin to ask these questions, the reasons we don't want to get well, I think it comes down to at least three things. Control, fear, and identity. Control, fear, and identity. Let's talk about these for a minute. What about control? Think about the person who refuses to forgive, refuses to let go of their anger because of wrong done against them and probably a justified anger, probably a, 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 a real injustice has been done. That's why we talked about the importance of forgiveness. And when we hold on to anger, we think it's doing something for us. What does anger do? It makes you feel powerful. It makes you feel like you have some control over the situation. You can control your anger and your behavior towards someone else or other people. And so sometimes we're unwilling to let go of what, anger we th what we think anger is doing to us, and we continue to hold on to it. And so we may want to get well, but what we want more is to feel like we're in control. Or think about the person that's addicted to drugs or alcohol or sex or, or whatever it is. See, this person, why do they keep going back? Well, because ultimately this sin is, is a form of comfort, and it's a way that they can control their comfort. The, the, the deceptive soothing of sin. And so rather than give that up, give up control of the one thing they feel like they can control in their life to have pleasure or release or escape or whatever it is, unwilling to give that up in the end. 
Ultimately, we want to be in control. We are terrified to give up control of our lives, of our pain, of the addictions that we go to. Which leads us to the second thing, fear. We're simply afraid of the unknown. We can't imagine life outside of our experiences. We've become too familiar with our pain, with the false names and false identities that we have taken on. We want to change, at least part of us, but we're too afraid of what change might actually look like. We're too afraid to risk. And so we're stuck. And what happens ultimately is this. We prefer the certainty of misery rather than the misery of uncertainty. Let me say that again. We prefer the certainty of misery, what's familiar, as opposed to the misery of uncertainty. I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know how I'm going to change. And I ultimately fear that. What really happens is we don't ultimately trust Jesus for who he is. We don't trust his goodness. We don't trust his love for us, what he intends to do. We're afraid that we're just going to be disappointed again, that we're going to be hurt again, that we're going to be humiliated in some way. We're afraid to feel the pain of our past. We're just afraid. And so we'd rather stay with what's familiar. We'd rather just stay with what we know. And the third thing is identity, that we take on these names and we become so used to them that we're identified by them. We've accepted them. I'm just a wounded person. I'm just a sinner. I'm just a bad person. I'm just never going to change. I don't want to hope anymore because I hope is dangerous. Hope will lead to disappointment. I'm just going to stay who I am and where I am. And so I want to change, but ultimately, I just don't believe I can. I just don't believe it's possible. But you see, the power of the gospel wants to break through these deceptions and to give you that new identity. And it may come in ways that you've never expected. I don't think this man expected that he was going to walk that day, but this is how Jesus chose to do it. And let's just think about that. What if the man had never gotten up? What if he didn't listen to Jesus' words? He would have never walked. He would have never experienced true change, true transformation, his new identity. He would have lived the rest of his life the same way he lived you know, his life already. What if he didn't trust Jesus' words? See, ultimately, he had to risk trusting what Jesus said to him. He had to risk trying to get up and walk. What if he had fallen down? What if he had been humiliated? What if he just got hurt again? He had to give up his fear of failure, his fear of being disappointed, and ultimately trust God. And this miracle happened. You see, he had to give up his old way of life, and whatever he was receiving, whatever he was used to, to risk what this new way of life will look like. And this is the question for us. And again, this is a a physical picture of what Jesus intends to do spiritually for us, to transform us. But for us to change, we're going to have to risk it all, just as this man did. We're going to have to risk it all with Jesus. We're going to have to trust him with our pain, with our stories, with our sins, with our wounds. We're going to have to give up our fears and face them We have to give up control of all these things that we cling to and risk it with God and listen to the words of Jesus and get up and walk. Ultimately, this means absolute and unconditional surrender to Jesus of all of who you are. And this is a scary thing. It it, it at least feels like a risk. But Jesus intends so much more. You see, without this kind of risk, there can be no restoration. Without risking Jesus with this, there can be no restoration. There's this great uh, picture in uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, book, The Voyage of the Don Treader, about this man, this boy named Eustace. And Eustace had succumbed to the powers of evil and was actually turned into a dragon. And he could return to being a human only if he was willing to let Aslan, which is the Christ figure, cut him open with his sharp claws. And so to Eustace, this was insanity. He thought he would perish, yet that was the whole point. His life depended on his willingness to die. He hated his condition and wanted to change, but he was terrified to die. He was terrified to be cut open by Aslan. 
And you see, this is our story. This is our predicament. This is what Jesus is calling us to, to die to ourselves, to let him peel away the parts of us that are not true and to restore us. And it requires us to die to ourselves, to give our whole lives to him, to surrender to him. But listen, what Jesus is offering us is true life, life eternal. See, we can risk losing with Jesus because Jesus is already one for us. And he gives us himself, the one thing that the world cannot take away, his power, his presence with us. And no amount of suffering or hardship or hurt or sin or anything else can take that away. It's the treasure of the gospel, and it transforms us if we would risk receiving it. If we would risk receiving Jesus into our life and following his words and giving our whole selves to him. You see, if we risk with him, we will eventually walk in ways that we never could before. He intends to make us able where we have been disabled. But we have to give ourselves to him. And at some point, we have to walk. And the truth is this, until we walk, we will never know that we have been healed. We will never know that we have been restored. At some point, we have to get up and walk. And I'll share a little bit of my own story here. I was uh, in ministry out in uh, Seattle in a church called Mars Hill Church. And um, I was an intern there, and I was on staff for a few years. And uh, I actually left uh, that church and moved out here. And, and when I moved out here, I'd, I'd had some ministry wounds. I was not interested in being in ministry. I was not interested in being in leadership again. I had some healing to do. Yet God had called me to seminary, which didn't make any sense to me. But I followed him. And sooner or later, I was confronted with the choice to step back into church leadership. And I was afraid. I didn't want the responsibility. I didn't want to be hurt again. I didn't want to go through any of that again. But God moved in my heart. He had healed me. I'd done some of the hard work of repentance and, and healing and restoration. And the only way that I could know that I had changed was to step back in to the very positions that I had been hurt. And when I did, I experienced God's power and presence. I got to see the ways that I had grown, that other people's words uh, were no longer as powerful to me. And so until we begin to walk, sometimes through the same pain, or at least confronting the same pain, until we're able to do that, until we do that, we'll never know that we've been healed, that we've been restored. And so this is an absolute surrender to Jesus, our whole lives. And the promise is transformation of true life, of joy, of freedom, of all these things we've been talking about. It's the promise of becoming whole, of living a transformed life. And there's nothing better. No sin, no addiction, no experience can, can, can outdo what it means to know Jesus and to walk with him. And God gives us the church to help us in this. We need each other. We need to be able to, to come to those who, um, who have walked the path before us and can lead us and can guide us through the process of transformation, who can walk with us. We need to hear their stories of redemption. We need to hear their stories of restoration. We need to hear their stories of how God has miraculously worked in their life to give us hope and courage to, to walk the same path. That's why at One Hope Church, we believe deeply in biblical community and encourage everyone to get into a group and to begin living this out. And I'll just tell you, throughout this series, I have heard some incredible stories in our groups of people coming and talking about things they've never talked about before, confession of sin, of healing and forgiveness, powerful stories of God working in our groups in this church. And we want that for you. So I'm gonna encourage you again Get connected. Get into a group. Start walking with people. It's what you were made for. And so this is the promise before us that Jesus wants to make us well. The question for us, the most important question for us is this. Do you want to get well? Will thou be made whole?
This is what we have to wrestle with. In our heart of hearts, deep down, at the deepest level, are we ready to forsake all identities, all addictions, all angers that we have held on to? Are you ready to risk your whole life with Jesus and watch him restore and transform you? Will you give your life to him? Do you want to be well? I hope so. And let's walk this out together. Jesus is waiting. He's calling out to you. He's ready to, to walk with you and transform you. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for the incredible work of Jesus, the incredible power and presence that is available to us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, now that you would move in our hearts, that you would cause us to wrestle with these questions, that we would forsake everything that we have held on to and cling to Jesus for true life, for real life, for a transformed life. Will you make us whole? God, we, we love you. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus, and by your spirit. Amen.